What I don't want is a bunch of people who are well equipped to learn, but don't know anything yet, who are making all the decisions. And I don't want a bunch of people who have become rigid over time when they're supposed to be fluid. And what we have now is a bunch of rigid people say, we make the most money when we believe what we believed in the 1970s and they're doing things. And we have a bunch of other people who are of the same age and the same experience level. We're saying that's a bunch of BS. And we've learned that over the last 40 years. Now we have this fight between the old world, which is crusty and not fluid, and the new world, which is fluid. And there's a lot of more people coming up who are younger, who are able to learn and willing to question things because they've been trained to smell BS because they've been fed so much of it. The egotistical people who think they're learned, they're the problem. The actual learned people working away in laboratories, they're the most important things we have because you won't learn to be a great research scientist unless you work with great research scientists who teach you how to do it. And it's that mentorship, the apprenticeship, the passing down through generations of knowledge of how to do science, that's important. Dave Asprey, welcome back to the Keto Camp Podcast, my friend. Ben, it's good to chat with you again. I want to start the conversation with a quote, and I want you to relate the quote. It's from Eric Hoffer. I want you to rel relate this quote to what's happening in the health industry. So here's mm -hmm. the quote. In times of change, learners inherit the earth while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with the world that no longer exists. What does that mean to you? Learners inherit the earth and the learned, I don't know. It's, Meaning it's those who are constantly learning inherit the earth, but the people who think they know it all, the learned are beautifully equipped to live in a world that no longer exists. I don't know that I think that's real. The people who tell them that the people who tell themselves that they're learned, those are the ones who are equipped for a world that doesn't exist. The ones who were actually learned have learned that they have to keep learning and keep changing what they believe, keep questioning what they believed. What I don't want is a bunch of people who are well equipped to learn, but don't know anything yet who are making all the decisions. And I don't want a bunch of people who have become, <clears throat> I don't want a bunch of people who become rigid over time when they're supposed to be fluid. And what we have now is a bunch of rigid people say, we make the most money when we believe what we believed in the 1970s and they're doing things. And we have a bunch of other people who are of the same age and the same experience level. We're saying that's a bunch of BS. And we've learned that over the last 40 years. So we have these hidebound institutions that have created that, that state. And if things are changing, they're changing very rapidly because of AI, because of innovation, and because we can now share information despite blatant censorship. Um, well, now we have this fight between the old world, which is crusty and not fluid, and the new world, which is fluid. And there's a lot of more people coming up who are younger who are able to learn and willing to question things because they've been trained to smell BS because they've been fed so much of it. So that's what I'm kind of saying things happen. The egotistical people who think they're learned, they're the problem. The actual learned people working away in laboratories, they're the most important things we have because you won't learn to be a great research scientist unless you work with great research scientists who teach you how to do it. And it's that mentorship, the apprenticeship, the passing down through generations of knowledge of how to do science, that's important. I love the answer. I love the breakdown there. So when you look at people in our space, uh, scientists, doctors, health influencers, whatever you want to call them, what, what do you see? Like, what do you like to see from somebody? You've interviewed mm -hmm. hundreds, if not thousands of people. What do you like to see when you start to have conversations with these individuals and what don't you like to see? What are some red flags? The first red flag you'll always see is if they're a takedown person, um, there are big issues, right? And it's one thing if you like poke fun at something, you can be playful about it, but there's an enormous number of really, really angry calorie counters. I think they're angry because they're hungry and malnourished because they don't believe that you know hormones or nutrients have anything to do with it. It's just about calories. And they will sit there. They have no interest in a dialogue. They have an interest in punching someone who disagrees with them. And since they can't do it in person, probably because they're bullied, they were bullied in seventh grade and they're still afraid, 
So they're actually like sitting there, like punching with their keyboards and feeling good about themselves. And then going on a, like an eating disorder diet and flexing their abs with some Instagram filters and feeling good about themselves. Okay. We have an equal number of vegans who are so vehement because of some trauma, probably saw a scab pulled off once and now they think they can't eat meat. Okay. And then we also have the keto people. That's a carb. If you eat a carb again, what I'm talking about here is polarization. Oh, and the carnivore people, anything from a seed, even if there's 500 studies that show it's good for you, it's from a seed. Therefore it's bad. Like it's polarization except for kale. Cause kale is just dumb. <laughs> but we could just get, I'm kidding. I think we could agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you see what I'm saying? It, yeah. They're doing the same thing with political parties. Um, they're doing the same thing with, you know, nationalism right now. Uh, the same thing with uh, anything they can think of to drive a wedge. Bottom line is, there should be a group of people who care a lot about getting control of our biology, willing to do and try and talk about and experiment with almost anything and be curious. And I like to call that biohacking. That's the definition of biohacking is around getting control of your own biology. And it was meant to pull the neuroscientists together and the bodybuilders and the anti-aging scientists so we could have conversations, right? And the sports trainers and people to figure out the human condition and ways to do things better. So when I see polarization, I kind of steer clear, right? I, one of the most kind of noteworthy things that happened to me in my journey, okay, I went on a very, very high fat, very low carbohydrate diet called the Atkins diet when I was, geez, 22 or maybe 25, and I lost 50 of my 100 pounds. It took me 10 years to lose the other 50 pounds. And then after that, after I started talking about the Bulletproof diet and all the things, cyclical ketosis, using the right fats and the right proteins, which is different than dirty keto, um, I went on a, a low, to a low-carb event, and there were enormous numbers of 300-pound people. Yeah. And I watched what they were eating, and they're like pork rinds with MSG and you know sucralose or NutraSweet. But it's keto. Well, well, yeah, and I'd be like, guys, you know, it seems like this diet isn't working for you. And this not in like a mean way, because I, I used to weigh 300 pounds. Like, I get it. Like you'll do anything in order to lose that weight. And what they'd say is, well, yeah, I plateaued. It's probably because I'm still eating too many carbs. So I'm going to go from 15 carbs down to 12 and see if it works. And so recognizing inflammation, all this stuff, it's hard to do. So the number one thing you can look for in anyone is, well, I'm kind of curious, like show me the data. Like I believe there's no good reason to go on a zero fat diet for long periods of time. However, there is enough evidence that shows if you eat a high starch, zero fat diet with lots of vegetables, you at least won't be hungry because you'll affect your ghrelin levels in an unusual way. But if you add a little bit of fat to that, it breaks it. Don't think that's a good diet, but the people who talk about satiety with no fat, they're not crazy. They're just asking people to do something that isn't good for them and is hard to do in the long term. So I'm like, pass me the butter because that raises ghrelin too. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah. But it's curiosity, right? And and also kindness. Like you can disagree. I've had vegans on my show. Just, just disagree with respect and and politeness, not with you know shouting down and physical insults about their moms. That's right. Yeah, no, and I've seen it too. In, in Unless the their moms are fat, then <laughs> <laughs> then it's all all green lights there. <laughs> I, I've seen it myself, and we're not gonna. I'm not gonna name any people specifically, but especially the calorie counting crowd. Mm -hmm. I mean, if somebody makes a video of my video. I get hundreds of these DMs. You probably do like, but really nasty DMs. And I'm sure you've seen it. Like, I love these guys. Commit suicide. And it's, and it's just outrageous. So, so let, let me give you the hack for that. Ben, you're going to love this. Um, this fitness chef guy, I've never heard of him. He has like, he goes, I have 800,000 followers and here's my clout score and all this stuff. And he, he does a video that says Dave's the, the biggest car artist of the year. Cause I told people that eating the right kind of fat in their coffee in the morning, might suppress hunger. And I have abundant data. People have lost more than a million pounds on the Bulletproof diet. And like, look, it works, right? And so I just kind of posted it on my own page. I said, hey guys, I won an award from this guy I've never heard of. You know, I'm the biggest con artist of the year. It's only April. And of course his post just gets spammed by my followers going, are you kidding? Like, like Dave's stuff really worked for me, but like real comments, not like, you know, you're a poop head or whatever the typical thing is. And then I used his account handle as a discount code for my own products. And that's how you handle the noisy critics, Ben. You use their name as a discount code because you actually are doing something useful and good. And your followers will just be like, hey, um, 
you know what? <laughs> this guy is not afraid. He actually saved me money and, and you just handle it like whatever. And the DMs, dude, you can block those guys. It takes yeah. them more time to send hate than it does for you to block it permanently and forever. And that's you right. win every time. But it's, yeah. a, it's, it's like mosquitoes. You know, you, you learn to deal with them. That's brilliant. I, I love that. Using their name as a coupon code. Yeah. You know, four years ago, it would have destroyed me. It probably left me like backtracking and uh, shivering in the corner of my room here. But when, as you know, when you're so confident from your competence and you've seen it with working with people, I've seen it working with people, I've seen it in the research, and then it just kind of just comes off of me like water off a of fish. But it's just so interesting. Every time a video gets made about me, I get those hundreds of comments of nasty, like suicidal comments. And one individual, I voice messaged him on, on uh, Instagram. And I'm like, because it was a video about if you want to age fast, eat every two to three hours, you're going to age faster than anybody you know, right? And this individual made a video about that. And I, I said, do you honestly believe it's healthy to challenge the digestive system, raise glucose and insulin every two to three hours? 88% of Americans are not bodybuilders metabolically healthy. What about those 88%, right? And then the back comment was, you're promoting an eating disorder by teaching fasting, which I'm sure you've heard all the time. So you know, I haven't heard it in a while. Are people still saying that? People are saying oh, you to me now. The the people that I talk with, I've I've taught seventy thousand people how to do intermittent fasting for free. Um, fastwithdave.com, right? And you know what they say? That's amazing. I didn't think I could go twenty four hours without being hungry. That was way easy. And like I haven't heard the eating disorder thing in a year. And I just yeah. wrote a, like a New York Times bestseller on fasting. So seriously, you got to change something about it. Because there's only like 4% of the population are sociopaths and psychopaths. And of that percentage, only some of them care about health. And so what you actually have, you have small tribes of heavily traumatized or sociopathic, they're, they're different, um, people with uh, like eating disorders. When, when you challenge their belief, then you challenge their reality and they feel threatened and then they act like, well, seventh graders. Right? And they're just not your customers. They're not your audience. They're not interested in change and they're not curious. So those are the ban, delete, ban, delete, but you ban and delete them only once and they lose their ability to pay attention to you and they're gone forever. Something else to do. When someone comes in and says, Dave, I, I disagree with you. Can you explain why mTOR? I'm like, dude, I love this guy. Like, let's talk. But if someone comes in, you, Dave, you're a total asshole and a con artist and all that stuff. I'm like, I, there's no response, but if there's any likes on there, I ban all the people who like us. It. It, it's a tiny percentage of shrill, angry, small-minded people who are doing this to social media. And they're easy to remove from your channels. And what's left is a safe and quiet, peaceful space for inquiry and curiosity. That's what I have on my channels. And like, I have no issues with getting rid of people who come into my living room and take a crap. So just do that. Clean them out, right? When all the, the people who never have any interest in your work except to poke at it when they can't see your work anymore they'll go away and they'll find someone else to abuse until they get some therapy yeah no it's great advice what i appreciate about you dave always have is that you've got the the world-class mindset of collaboration creation conversation versus the amateur compete bully um, go back and forth so i i love that about you and your work i, I want to <laughs> transition the conversation to the hits we take going through our day to day, uh, living uh, this day and age and planet Earth. Uh, I, I like to relate this to professional athletes, the, the world class athletes. We'll talk about Tom Brady, Dwayne Wade, Kobe Bryant. The list goes on and on and on. What they have in common is they change their game up towards the second half of their career in order to extend their career. Right. Dwayne Wade stopped going to the basket as much. He became a jump shooter. Tom Brady sits in the pocket. So what can we do? Maybe what are the top five hits we're taking at the cellular level that we can start make, taking action on to take less hits so we could extend our life so we could get up to 180, like your goal, or at least to 120 on planet Earth? What a great question. There are things you do that make you weak, and there are things you do that make you strong. Because especially if you're an entrepreneur or really just alive today, or if in the, you're in the first half of your life, you're very likely to say, well, I'm going to do the things that make me strong. And it's not psychologically comfortable to say, oh, I have a weakness. The, the, the body automatically shies away from thinking about weakness because it might be scary. And the body wants to feel safe in the world. Otherwise, it thinks there's a tiger. So this isn't your brain doing it. 
it's the brain that's in your your meat operating system, as I like to describe it. So imagine you're going to take your your car in uh, to a, a racing mechanic. You're, you know, I'm going to turn my Toyota Camry into you know a dragster. Well, you've got 15 pounds or sorry, 15 bags of cement in the trunk. And the mechanic's like, so you want it to corner better, right? And you say, yeah. He goes, well, how about we take all the crap out of the trunk so it'll weigh less? And then you're like, oh, that might be easier. And you don't have to change the suspension. You don't have to add a supercharger. Like, you don't have to do any of that stuff because the car is now faster, lighter, and more nimble just because you stopped carrying so much baggage. Now, what types of baggage are we carrying in our cells and in our behaviors? And those are the things that make us weak. So step one in the things that I teach are uh, things you'd hear like at the biohacking conferences is let's get rid of the kryptonite and then pick up the weights. And most people are like, screw that. Nothing could make me weak. I'm just going to lift harder and I'll just like run a marathon and I'll start 10 companies and like, yeah, and have no erections and go bald early. Like, great. You just overtrained and overstressed yourself. Like, that's not how it works. Yeah. Right. I'm not saying this because I'm so wise. I'm saying this because I've done all that. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's what happens when you overtrain and overstress at work is your cortisol goes up and erectile function changes. Right. Fortunately, it changes right back when you fix things. So like how, how would we think about that from a cellular level? Number one, stop eating omega-6 oils canola, soy, corn, anything that ate those as its primary food, industrial raised meat, especially chicken is the worst. And also a lot of nuts. You know, a lot of the, the paleo movement is nuts, 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 nuts. Look, nuts are better than candy. Unfortunately, in addition to the inflammatory molecules from you know, chapter one of the Bulletproof Diet about oxalic acid and lectins and phytic acid and things like that, um, they also have usually the wrong kinds of fats, unless it's cashews or macadamias, in which case they have the best uh, ratios of any of them. So if you do that, how long will it take you to flush the kryptonite out of your system? About two years. Uh, one of the studies uh, that I cited, I think it was my first big book, uh, was around the half-life of fat in cells. And you wouldn't know this unless you're into this stuff, but the membrane of your cell is actually a whole bunch of tiny droplets of fat. And it changes its composition based on what you eat. And some cell membranes and parts of the body change more quickly than others, particularly the white fat in your body changes rapidly. So if you eat more French fries because you just had a cheat day where you think it's okay to eat really bad fat that gets incorporated into your tissues and the half-life of it is two years, well, you could do that on a cheat day, but you might get something less harmful and get French fries made in butter or tallow mm -hmm. and then not deal with all that. Yeah. So you go through all this and you say, all right, I'm going to radically reduce seed oils and nut oils in my life. Two years later, half of your cell membranes will have turned over and been made out of more stable, healthier fats. And two years later, you're at 75%. And two years later, something else down to 82 and a half percent or something. So Strangely enough, most people who start putting butter and MCT in their coffee after two years of going, oh my God, I can't get enough of this. Like it is my lifeblood. It's almost, almost universally two years. You're like, you know what? I love it, but I don't need as much butter as I did before. And that's because your body finally got sufficiency of the things that are present in butter that are not present in plant oils. And then over the next two years, like, you know, I put a little butter in most of the time and eventually transition to, you know, I have some black coffee. Sometimes I put butter in MCT if I want extra energy. Sometimes I use prebiotic fiber, but you fixed your biology. So that's one of the big answers there is don't do omega-6 oils, but it, there's a timeline for that, yeah. right? The second thing- Before before you move on to the second thing, I want to know how you handle it at restaurants, right? I was in- um Austin, Texas, just last week and speaking at Paleo Effects. I was having dinner with the Pampas, uh, Dan and Marilee. Oh, I, I love Dan. Right. Yeah, I know you're friends with them. Fancy restaurant. And at the at the start, Marilee, and this is what I do too, but Marilee kind of jumped the, the gun here, told the waitress, we're all allergic to vegetable oil at this table. What are the options? So do you do some, something like that? Like, what do you do at restaurants? What are some tips for my audience? Um, you just have to assume that it's going to be cooked in vegetable oil. Right. And that means you order the wild caught fish or if they have grass fed meat, you do it. Right. And you order that and say, bring me some steamed veggies. Right. 
And do you have any butter back there? Look, corn and soy fed butter is probably good enough if you do it occasionally, grass fed's better. I am well known for carrying a brick of grass fed butter in my bag and I'll whip it out at restaurants, no It's a great idea, I love that. <laughs> I mean, and then what you really need is clean fat and some protein that's not full of glyphosate and other garbage and some veggies. You can do that almost anywhere. Um, I had a hard time in Mexico. Unfortunately, I have the genetics that makes me allergic to the nightshade family. When I eat that stuff, I have the arthritis that I've had my entire life. It's gone entirely unless I eat, you know, one taco with chili in it, and then it comes back for a week. Uh, and I get all kinds of other effects, just like lectins from nightshades have always done to me. So I tried to go to Mexico and say no chili in your food. Well, I did, right? I had a lot of, you know, grilled shrimp and octopus um, which was, uh, which was edible. And the other thing is when you travel, bring some protein powder or at least some amino acid powder, and then you just don't care, right? Oh, I'll just have a salad, right? I don't want your dumb dressing, bring a little packet of MCT oil or just eat the lettuce. It, it just doesn't matter. Eating is a social activity and most dinners are too late anyway at these events and you should be eating earlier. So when you lost your hunger and you can go 24 hours without eating and you have protein powder if you really need it, that's what I do. And I travel, you know, five or six months out of the year sometimes and I don't starve. I also eat a lot of sushi because that's a clean food. You're like, well, it's fish and seaweed. I know what you put in that, nothing. And the rice, I'm not afraid of carbs. I just don't eat too many of them and cooked and cooled rice. Wait, is that a resistant starch? Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> Do you take a binder before you have sushi just for any uh, potential he heavy metals? Yeah. For, in fact, that was one of my early blog posts was like take chlorella mm -hmm. with sushi. Cause I noticed before I started Bulletproof, I was doing a ton of yoga, like five times a week in a class. And if I'd have sushi, I couldn't do the eyes closed, one legged pose. Hmm. Um, in fact, I was doing it mostly there in Mountain View. And so I'm like, wait a minute. And then I tried the chlorella thing back then because I'd done a lot of work on metal detox. I had high mercury and high lead. Me too. Uh, in my twenties, and um, there is a noticeable difference. So I do carry chlorella with me, and I will take it uh, when I have like a heavy fish meal. I also, if I travel all the time, if you eat too much fish, it won't work well from a fatty acid perspective. Like mm -hmm. you're going to need some steak. So find the grass fed steakhouse occasionally, and and just go to town. So the omega six topic. Before we move on to the second tip here. You're, you're referring to adultered omega-6. Is there, is there a time and place for unadultered, high-quality um, omega-6 fats? Not for most people, I don't believe. For most um, because their ratio is so high, omega-6 to omega-3, is that why? Yeah. Uh, so there's a ratio for anti-aging. It's 4 to 1, omega-6 to omega-3 that you'd want to get in a blood cell panel. And I've gotten mine down to 1.28 to 1, which is probably too low. It's hard to do that, but I pulled it off. So I was like, so little omega-6 that my ratio dropped. And I don't think that was ideal. And I know uh, one professor from UC San Diego, uh, Larry Smarr, um, who's a, just a brilliant kind of computer scientist slash biohacker, um, he, I think he got his down to 0.68 once, he was telling me. Wow. I don't think going too low is good. I wouldn't want to go below two. I don't think that's yeah. beneficial. You will not have a problem if you eat and you are alive with having too much omega-6. I've also hung out with Udo from Udo's Oils, who's actually a brilliant and interesting guy, right? And so I spent actually about half a day with him. I was like, all right, I'm going to give this a try. So I took his you know, carefully prepared omega-6 oils mm -hmm. and I added them. Um, to uh, my diet at the appropriate amounts um, over a uh, three or six month period, my inflammation went up. Like I, I didn't get the purported benefits. Which, which, uh, uh, which inflammatory markers went up? Um, CRP mm -hmm. uh, and uh, let's see, homocysteine didn't go up. Uh, mostly CRP. I'm just thinking about it. And I don't think I did a cytokine panel back then, but I would have guessed IL-6 from the symptoms I was having, but you could like see it in my skin. Like you get mm -hmm. like puffiness that wasn't there. And, you know, so I, I gave it a good shot and all the evidence that I know of says you don't want to add it, but at least if you're going to have omega-6, you want unoxidized omega-6. And what I like about Udo uh, and about Udo's oil, and I'm not picking on him in any way, like he's got a body of science and people, some people apparently um, he follow his recommendations and get good results or he wouldn't be doing what he does for decades. So like mm -hmm. you, you got to respect that there's probably some nuggets in there, right? And... I don't, 
I don't see the case for taking oxidized omega sixes ever. Like French fries made in canola oil are just a punch in the face. Just smoke a cigarette already or a joint. Like seriously, it's about the equivalent amount of biological damage, maybe less for the cigarette and the joint. Yeah. Um, so French fries are just crazy. And then, you know, it, if you wanted to have a couple tablespoons of omega six um, cold pressed, cold stored in the dark omega sixes, okay. Flaxseed oils in, Ayur in Ayurveda, it's a drying oil because it, it does something bad to cell membranes. But there are people who, they fix themselves with a little bit of flax oil. But if they take ground flax meal and bake cookies out of it, it's really bad for them because the flax in that case, it gets oxidized by heat and light and air and all that. And that's a highly, highly damageable oil. Too much flax, even in chickens, will make sick chickens because they can't handle the instability of the oil. Yes, I'm an organic farmer and I've got chickens and cows and pigs and sheep. So there's probably some ratios we don't know and they're probably individualized. But when someone says a high fat diet, you can pretty much laugh at them. If they do not tell you what fat, mm -hmm. it does not mean anything. Let's say a high protein diet, like a sarin, the nerve gas, that's a plant-based protein. That's probably not what you wanted to eat, but they, they say it or like, oh, red and processed meats. Guys, processed meat and red meat are different things. Why are you conflating them? And then what did the red meat eat? So there's just not enough granularity because people are lazy. We like to just put stuff in a bucket and say it's all the same. It's not. Yeah. And what you need, Ben, is probably different than what I need. So you might need 17 drops of um, you know, cold pressed omega-6 oils to be perfectly balanced. And I might need 12 or none. Right. We don't have the science, but we're getting there with machine learning. It's actually a really fascinating time. Um, mm. But I can say that supplementing omega sixes, do it for two weeks. And if your rashes go away, your brain works better and you can see better then, dude, you needed it. But if nothing good happens, I don't think given what we know about the changes in something called cardiolipin mm -hmm. inside your mitochondrial membrane, you get negative changes from too much omega-6. Like, why would you add more? Trust me, it's present in adequate amounts in your butter, in the small amount of nuts you probably eat, and in beef. <laughs> beef is 1.6% omega-6, right? I've also seen um, fish oil, actually. I've seen some, some research on fish oil uh, pushing out cardiolipin. Uh, and fish oil is also a PUFA, isn't it, Dave? It's a, it, it's a, it has a many double bonds, I believe five double bonds, but of course it depends on the processing of it. And, but what are your thoughts on fish oil in general? You know, fish oil is really interesting because we love these heuristics. Like uh, my, my friends in the carnivore world will be like, anything from a seed is bad. I'm like, well, there's like 500 studies about that seed, but that other seed is totally bad. Like it's not that simple. So when you look at, omega-6 or omega-3 or PUFA fats, it's easy to say that they're all bad for you because they're unstable. But it's also easy to say that your body needs arachidonic acid or your body needs DHA and EPA. And there's also abundant evidence that you need different levels of those things at different stages of life and depending on if you're a man or a woman. And just because you need some, that means it's good for you. Therefore, you should have half the bottle, right? right this right. is just human thinking that if it's good, more is better. So if you're one of the people who overdoses on omega-3, whether it's EPA or DHA or just the, the general um, omega-3s from plant-based omega-3s that don't convert well in the body at all, they convert, uh, I think, 45 to 1 ratio of converting if your body can even make EPA and DHA out of them. So you don't want too much fish oil, but there is plenty of evidence that small doses of fish oil are good for you. And I see lots of people, like one of the podcasts I recorded yesterday on my show, 74 year old a member of my community where we're doing like an intervention. She's like, why do I keep getting blood spots on my hands? I'm like, well, that's interesting. You're doing five grams a day of high dose of krill oil, herring oil, and fish oil, and all of the enzymes that break up clotting. Mm -hmm. So it was just an overdosing of fish oil. So stop the fish oil get it to work, or at least get it down. I do a gram a day and I weigh about probably about 230 and I'm around 11, 12% body fat. So maybe you need 800 or so, but if you're pregnant or you're thinking about getting pregnant and you're a woman, um, then you need to heavily dose DHA, not enough to cause bleeding or whatever, but your body will store DHA in your butt and your thighs. <laughs> and it will preferentially donate that DHA to your baby because 
your babies actually really need that. Mm -hmm. And it's correlated with bigger brains. My first book was on fertility. But if you continue to to everybody that I know who gets pregnant, the better baby book, it's the first book I get to everybody. It's a great book. Thanks, man. That that book has helped a lot of people. It's one of those like kind of continuous things. And it's, it, it just matters, right? But if you're the guy and you take high dose DHA and you're not nursing a baby, it's not the same and it's probably going to be inflammatory. So, you know, the answer is pretty nuanced, but you can say probably about a gram. And as you age and as you're an adult, more EPA and less DHA. And as a young fertile woman or as a teen or a child, more DHA would be appropriate. But large doses are inflammatory because your body can't deal with it. Yeah. So it's like enough building blocks. But imagine if you're like, I want to build my house. So you get 10 dump trucks worth of bricks, but you only needed two dump trucks mm-hmm. worth of bricks. What do you do with all the extra? Well, it's going to cause trouble somewhere. And that's kind of how it is with omega-3s. That happens a lot. I mean, I, I read a study from the NIH that showed for a large adult man, six foot, 200 pounds, uh, the daily recommendation for EPA and DHA is about 7.2 milligrams for the brain. And to your point, well, low for the brain. Okay, right. Yeah, that's what it said, and I could share it with you. But one one capsule typically right. is a, a thousand milligrams. People are like your your clients taking three or four milligrams, so it's a super physiological overdose. And to your point with the analogy with the trucks, um, it's probably not a good idea to overdose. It had to be seven point two milligrams per kilo, or just seven point two milligrams total for an total. average body. Total. How do they make the difference between, you know, the 300 pounder and the 100 pounder? This was based off of a six foot, 200 pound male. Um, So that was the recommendation on a daily basis for the brain. Mm, That's probably for, for, but based on physiological measures of what's in the brain versus what it consumes. Correct. Yeah. Got it. So um, I imagine that there's some variance there. In one of my books, I think Headstrong, um, which, and I have to toot my own horn for a second here. It was on the the monthly science bestseller list between Homo Deus and Sapiens. It was like <laughs> the meat and the sandwich. I'm like, dude, that's the coolest thing ever because those books are legit. That um, is awesome. Well deserved too. I was pleasantly surprised and didn't expect that um, because I usually it's like yeah. the how to kind of things. But anyway, in that book, I wrote about how different cells in the body respond to changes in dietary fat, and it turns out that you know the brain it will say 45 percent saturated no matter what you do. It is required for working. But about 15% of the cells in your brain are very clearly going to swing wildly based on omega-6 and omega-3 levels. But if you look at your white fat, I think it's close to like 50% of that can change based on omega-6 and omega-3 in saturated fat. So you eat more saturated fat, you actually have more stability in your fat and more energy versus more lethargy because omega-6 oils slow down energy production in cells and cause eventually thyroid exhaustion. They do. So it's a, it's a, a, very, a very questionable thing to say that you only need 7.2 milligrams. There is um, one kind of really radical group that I don't want to call out by name uh, who's been saying for years, you know, all PUFAs of any amount are toxic and dangerous, but they have to willfully ignore huge amounts of evidence that are saying not always, right? And it's the not always that that's where science happens. So you look at that, and you go, hmm, if they're so toxic, why can this group do this? And what do we see in that group? And why, why is it present in our body at 1% of body weight? If it's toxic, mm-hmm. that's not right. Mm-hmm. And what happens if we exhaust mice of that? Oh, they die. Well, mm-hmm. hmm. Maybe it doesn't mean they're bad. Maybe it means an overdose is bad. Let's define an overdose. And that's like a curious scientist versus someone who says, I have a heuristic. All seeds are bad. All oils are bad. All animals are bad. Those are all nonsense, lazy thinking. And it's not that they're bad people. Usually there are sociopaths, but usually it's just people who are saying it's so complex. My biological need is to simplify. So I don't have to think about it all the time. So I simplified into a basic rule. I follow that. And I just believe that. And then you challenge my beliefs, then you threaten me and all what we talked about before. So that's what it is with omega-3s. There is no evidence that completely avoiding fish oil or any omega-3 of any kind is beneficial for you. I can tell you it's expensive and difficult to do that. You'll never eat a fish again. There's also interesting questions about SN2 fish oil, where the carbons are, whether it's been molecularly distilled. My recommendation for people is 
focus on krill or fish egg oil, like herring egg oil. That's what I use in the one that I formulated uh, with when I was previously working with Bulletproof. I'm, I don't know if it's the same formulation that I made when I was there because um, I don't talk to the company. But there are um, a variety of herring oil or krill oil products out there. And so you can take a lower dose with higher efficacy that gets into the brain because it's phosphorylated. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's worth considering. Yeah, great. Okay, so we've only done the first thing here. We've got uh, less than 15 minutes to go. So we got four more things. We're taking hits. Uh, what's the number two? All right, so we had our omega-6s. Um, the other one is we underestimate what glyphosate contamination and uh, things like food colorings, uh, dyes, and artificial flavors do to our brain, to our hunger hormones. And if you're doing that stuff regularly, you're probably just doing it wrong, right? So you got to cut those things out. And a lot of people who are on the, the low carb, anything that's not a carb, I can eat bandwagon, uh, when they quit doing a NutraSweet, they feel a lot better and they start to lose weight again. I was a NutraSweet addict when I weighed 300 pounds. I was like, I'm on a low fat, low calorie diet. I go to the gym 90 minutes a day, no matter what. And I drink a giant big gulp every day made of you know diet soda because I don't want any calories, right? And I finally, in one class, I, I drank a huge one after a workout and like more than I normally would have. And I started like, I, like my brain shifted. I was like passing out and I felt like I was kind of tripping. And I'm like, wow. I think it was the soda. And then I looked, I'm eating 17 sticks of gum a day with new sweet. And I backed off of it and my brain got way better. And I actually started to lose weight. That was my first warning. And I looked at all the research and I was like, good God, like, who approved this? Like, oh, of course, Rumsfeld did. So, you know, there's that. But um, I would say if you take, you pay attention to those as a major source of kryptonite. The third one is, look, this is a bulletproof diet 101. Plants are not all your friends. You cannot say that all plant foods are good for you the same way because if you go outside and just take a bite of the first plant you see, you'll probably die or at least get hospitalized. Plants are inherently toxic to us and we can eat a small number of species. We can eat a small number of species because apparently as humans, we hate starving to death. So when there is no high quality food, then you eat low quality food and you survive, but you do not thrive which is the definition of uh, veganism. <laughs> and when you look at what each of these plants do, there's five big categories of, of mother nature created toxins that are seriously messing with people. And one of them is phytic acid, which you're like, what? Well, this pulls minerals out of your body. And since our food is devoid of minerals because we've destroyed our topsoil and we stopped doing regenerative agriculture, that's a problem. So phytic acid, oxalic acid from kale and raw spinach, which is a major cause of kidney stones and gout. Like, oh yeah, and it tasted bad too, right? And then you have um, histamine, which forms especially in fermented soy or fermented fish products or just leftovers. It causes masses of inflammation in a huge number of people. You have mycotoxins from the field and from storage. There are different categories and you also can have them in your house. Moldymovie.com, free movie about that. Great movie. Thank you. Um, and let's see, histamine mycotoxins, I've, there's five. Uh, oh, and lectins. lectins. Yeah, lectins were the other big one. Um, and I'm like, guys, these are the reason that plants may mess with you, but it doesn't mean they will because different people have different sensitivities. It's like a lock and a key. Like you may be completely able to enjoy habaneros. I love habaneros, but they are absolutely bad for me, right? But I still love them. I just don't eat them anymore because I learned they were a guilty suspect. So if you take these five categories of toxins and say, which ones are the problem I have, then you can choose the plants that work for you. But if you don't know they exist, you walk around every day eating stuff that makes you weak, or in my case, gave me arthritis and brain fog and food cravings. Hmm, maybe you should stop doing that. So that's three. Yep. The other one is sleep. I've hated sleep for most of my life because it's such a waste of time. And I still have a love hate relationship with it. I am an expert sleeper. I get an hour and a half to two hours of deep and an hour and a half to two hours of REM sleep in six hours of sleep. My average is six and a half hours a night for years, right? I didn't used to get that. I was down to, you know, five minutes of deep sleep. Wow. <laughs> into my life. Well, you go um, zero carb for too long. It's not uncommon. Yeah. Um, that happened when I was doing the extreme like carnivore diet kind of thing. After three months of that, 
my body was like, you know, this isn't working for you, man. And was telling me in lots of ways. Mm, that's interesting. I've seen that a lot with uh, people who are in ketosis for too long. That's why Bulletproof Diet, like you have to cycle because I didn't cycle and saw what would happen and I added it into the plan. And then the final thing is actually junk light. And people don't talk about this as much, but the circadian clock that tells all your organs to work together, all your cells to work together at the same time, it is set primarily by light and then by food and then by temperature and then probably by social interaction, right? So that means that if you're saying, oh, I want to go to sleep well, but I have bright lights, it doesn't matter if you ate an early dinner because the lights were trumping the food timing. So for me, the thing that's made the single biggest difference, the, enough that I was willing to start a company over it, is the, the True Dark glasses. Like these are the, the daytime ones that cut out some blue, but not all blue, but the ones that got rid of my jet lag and the ones that doubled my deep sleep are called the sunset lenses. They're not just red. There's multiple things. It's actually a patent pending thing. Um, but what's going on here is every color and angle and intensity of light that's documented to control the SCN in your body, we control it. It's called True Dark is the name of that company. And it's not going to change my life if you, you or any listener buys it or doesn't buy it. I make these because I couldn't buy them and they work for me and for many others. So that's it. Junk light. We've got plant toxins. We've got man-made toxins. We've got bad fats. And what, oh, and was it sleep was the other one? Sleep was the other one. Yeah. yeah. You know, the, 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 that's a great list right there. If you were just to eliminate those kryptonites, then add in some different things. But by default, by eliminating that, you're going to have to replace it with something else, right? So that's an amazing list. Just doing those five, taking action on those five things right there will add several years to your life, many, many years to your life and happiness as well. You know, yeah. the, the thing about the junk light, um, uh, I interviewed uh, Ari Witten, who I think you just had uh, on your podcast. Yeah, he was just well. on my show. Yeah, and he was telling me that um, the average person by the age 70 has lost about 70% of the mitochondria. And one of the most powerful antioxidants for the mitochondria is melatonin. And what depletes it is the junk light, right? So that's a huge tip that a lot of people don't get. I get morning sunlight, go on my balcony here where I live, I get the sunset. And I wear uh, blue light blocking glasses at night. And that goes a long way. My fiance makes fun of me but when I put them on. Blue isn't going to do it at night. If you're letting green, amber, or violet in, they do the same thing for your timing system. Blue controls melatonin, but the other colors are important for the timing system that's not just melatonin. Right. So I so, wear the, the Swannies. Are those not doing what you're sure? They, they only block blue. That's one of the four colors. There's also angle and intensity. Right. So I'm gonna get some true darks is what you're I mean, I'll, I'll send some to you if you want to try. And, you know, I'm friends with James and, you know, no, no bad aspersions. They're just blue blocking. We've known about since the eighties. Um, and there's a variety of blue blockers out there, but if you block all blue during the day, you're not going to get a wake up signal. And if you block it at night, you're still getting the other colors that mess with you. Hmm. So it's, it was a big kind of conundrum for me because I've been doing blue light blocking or other light blocking since geez. It has to be like the early aughts uh, in one way or another because I was figuring out that this works. But eventually I, I realized it was more than just blue. But what people don't know is that melatonin makes you insulin resistant. That's why you don't eat after dark, right? Because as soon as it's dark, then all of a sudden your body is like, I don't want to be doing calories right now. I will if you make me, but my cells are doing something else because melatonin and the other central timing system told them to midnight snacks are particularly bad. And if you use a continuous glucose monitor like levels by the levels.link slash Dave, I think puts you, puts you at the front of the line, unless Ben, you have a code telling that I don't think I get paid on that. That's just like a, people want to get to the front of the line. Yeah. They're awesome. I've interviewed Casey here as well. Okay. So if you have a code and replace what I just said with your code, no, I no, that's fine. Yeah. Um, but what's going on there is you, know, you can look at your blood sugar, eat the dark chocolate at 5 PM and eat it at 9 p.m. and watch what your blood sugar does. Yeah. And to me, at 9 p.m., you weren't like watching like daylight on a big screen TV with your lights on overhead. You're going to have a substantially different response to the same thing just because of the color of light. That's right. Yeah, I've seen that with the CGM. Uh, it shuts down, melatonin shuts down uh, the receptor sites that produces insulin, to your point. Uh, when, when, when melatonin's up, insulin is down. So it, it could create higher glucose levels throughout the night when you eat before bed. And I saw that with myself using a CGM. Um, okay. We let's transition to your conference. Let's talk a little bit about your conference. Oh, yeah. I, I attended the one you just did in Orlando, the biohacking I mean, conference, the first ever one, right? 
Yeah. So, the, what do you mean the first ever? The, the eighth one that's coming up, this right? The eighth one, but this was like the, the conference that launched the world of biohacking. We had like 100 people. It was 10 years ago. 100 people. Oh, you mean one of the first ones to like do a biohacking conference? Yeah. Biohacking I, conference to exist. Yeah. Yep, this, yeah. This is the continuation of that. Yeah. So you've started a great movement. Number eight is coming up in September in uh, California. It's going to be in Beverly Hills, September 15th through the 17th. I attended the one you just had last year in Orlando. And yeah. uh, I've been to a lot of conferences. I've spoken at a lot. I've attended a lot. And man, the, the, you're, the way that you do it is just so impressive. And I know that you've heard this from other people, but it's it's true. I mean, it matters, uh, Ben. Thank you. Yeah, the de the attention to detail, the vendors, the 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 coffee that we had, and the the speakers, and just the way everything was set up, it is so impressive, and it sets the bar so high that when I go to other conferences, I'm just like, oh man, they got to learn from Dave. <laughs> so share a little bit more about the one coming up in uh, California. Well, it's at the Beverly Hilton, which is where they do the Golden Globes, and one of the reasons I do it there is it's one of the few places that's willing to do food right. So we serve really good food because who wants to go to a conference and eat hot dogs, right? You're not going to feel good. You're not going to learn. And the difference between a normal conference, you go to lots of conferences and get lectures. You go to YouTube and get lectures. So we have world-class speakers, but we also have a tech hall with more than a hundred vendors where you go and play with the toys. That was why I originally created this. I'm like, I want to go play with all the toys. Like, I, I want to talk to the guys who made them. And I want to like try zapping myself with this and try this. And like, does it work? Is it real? And also I wanted community, which is the most important thing. Um, people who are interested in health and being good people are different than kind of the health extremists that we talked about earlier. So if you want to feel like you're not crazy and feel like, oh my God, there's other people who care about this and they can see what's possible. It's meant to be inspirational and kind of like telling you, yeah, keep doing this because it works. I've probably had a dozen media outlets who've covered the biohacking conference and they say, it's weird, but I feel like everyone here is either a model or just ridiculously healthy, right? And what's happening there is, no, not everyone's a model, but most people, no matter what shape their body is in, whatever their age is, they just have enough energy, right? Because they've learned enough from biohacking that like they can show up and like be happy and have fun. And then of course you get to see and interact with, you know, Dr. Mercola says this is his favorite conference. And you see many other people who write books, people who are top experts. And I do really fun panels. Like there's one on sex and relationships. I'm like, yeah, we'll have a relationship therapist. Yeah, we'll have like a shamanic energy worker. Hey, we'll have a professional dominatrix. Like let's be curious about the human condition. Let's learn what we can learn from people who are experts in weird stuff that you'd never think mattered and ask them how and why it matters. So I've, the feedback is overwhelmingly positive. We always serve, you know, danger coffee now. And anything you pick up there, these are vendors, anything that I'm like, that's not okay. I just don't let the vendors in. So there's people who try to get in with multi-level marketing or whatever. I'm like, no, you're out. So it, it's actually, you have to apply to exhibit there. And then my team and I, literally every vendor I've approved. And there's somewhere I'm like, I don't know if this works, but you have enough evidence that it might work. So you're in. But if I'm like, I know that's bad. Absolutely not. You can't come in. And okay. so um, it's a very high standard, but that's what yeah. the biohacking conference is all about. It's, it's the experience and the community and the knowledge. Yeah, no, it's incredible. You're right. There's a lot of good looking people there. I remember that in Orlando, healthy uh, men and women, because they're doing the things that they're learning from you and, and the conference. And the lineup of speakers are incredible this year. Of course, um, my mentor, Dr. Pomp, is going to be returning, but there's also Mercola Gundry. <laughs> Will call. I mean, a whole bunch of my friends and colleagues will be there. My audience would love to see Ben Keto Camp at your uh, speaking at your conference, Dave, as well. By the way, all and, right. Uh, so you could learn more about that by going to biohackingconference.com. Highly recommend you attend. It's gonna, you know, warning. It's gonna set the bar really high. So when you go to other conferences, it's just not gonna live up to it. So just be prepared for that. But it's an amazing experience. You mentioned. Danger Coffee. I was looking it up and I'm actually excited to give it a try. Sh share a little bit more about why you wanted to uh, start this new coffee. Sure. So I am no longer working with Bulletproof. I'm, I'm still a shareholder, um, but I don't have any, uh, any visibility into uh, what they're doing. So um, after consulting with them about what coffee I would have um, at the coffee shops that I run, which are now the, the Upgrade Cafe, uh, I said, all right, I'm going to have to make my own, my own coffee here. So danger coffee is a new thing in coffee. And 
my view on coffee is that it is a ritual and a habit that we do every day. And what can we do that does not spoil the coffee experience that makes you better off than you were before? I'm a huge fan of mushrooms and Chinese herbs. It just makes coffee taste funny. So I don't want to put it in my coffee. I want to take them as pills or tinctures and then drink a cup of coffee that feels right. And I also looked at what problem can I solve for people that isn't solved today? And the number one problem that's holding people back biologically is probably those omega-6 fats. I can't fix that for you unless you put some butter in your coffee. That's been done but I can fix mineral deficiency because the more plant-based you are, the more the plants suck minerals out of your body and the more you eat anything, the less minerals you get because you're just not getting minerals from your foods unless you eat liver and oysters to abundant levels every day, which nobody really does. So everybody, whether they're a biohacker or they just like coffee, needs more trace minerals. And I figured out a way, actually even have a patent pending on it, of getting the minerals into the coffee so that when you brew your coffee, the coffee tastes good, but the type of minerals I'm using actually clean toxins out of coffee, even though the, the coffee is toxin free. And what you get is a full dose of trace minerals and an amazing cup of coffee because it has electrolytes in it as well. You feel really different after you drink it. It's not as different as if you put MCT and butter in coffee, but if you have a black danger coffee, and a black whatever other coffee, you are going to feel the danger coffee is different and gave you like a lift. And if you do the full butter MCT thing, you're like, okay, this is a different level. And plus it tastes really good because this is the first time I've been able to do a fermented clean coffee. All the other coffees I've created were unfermented to block toxin formation. And we found a way to do fermentation so that most coffee is fermented either in water or in air. So this is like really flavorful, amazing coffee. And it gives you minerals that otherwise you have to buy and take. So it's actually cost effective. It saves you a step from trying to take trace minerals. And man, it's just, it's a good experience. Danger coffee. The name comes from feeling dangerously good. I'm tired of people telling me, oh, do this for your own safety, even though it's stupid. So I am consciously building a, a world full of people who might be dangerous because they have so much energy. They're just going to say no to stupidity. They're going to do the right thing, even if it's hard. So anyone with enough energy is inherently dangerous. And I want you to be dangerous too. dangercoffee.com. I love that. I can't wait to try. I'm going to get some dangercoffee.com. We'll put a link down below. Last Thanks. question for you before we wrap this up. What are you grateful for today, Dave? You know, I am grateful that there are so many people paying attention to their health now. Uh, if you look back, you know, two and a half years ago, there were a lot of really unhealthy people who just didn't care. And then suddenly they got a reminder, a very small percentage reminder um, that, hmm, if I'm really unhealthy, maybe I can't take a hit. And maybe they still don't care much about their health, but they want to be more resilient. So now there's been a, a boom in people interested in being at least a little bit healthier, or just recognizing that if I continue doing what I did before I spent two years locked in my house, maybe that's not going to end well whenever the next thing comes. So now there's just more awareness. And also I'm grateful for laziness because mother nature wired all of us to use as little energy as possible. That's part of not starving to death. So laziness drives all of our innovation and all of the people who say, I want to be healthier, but I'm lazy. They're the ones who are going to make things like my upgrade labs company successful. I'm like, I will get you there in far less time because I can exercise you better than mother nature. Right. So we're there. Like we have all the drive for innovation. We have the interest in health that wasn't there before. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about those. Yeah, it's exciting. Well, you're a huge part of why people are get, becoming aware of their health. And uh, I, I'm, I'm so grateful for you, Dave, and the work that you've put out for so many years. You've been a huge inspiration to me. So congrats on the transition, the new adventures. And uh, I support you, man. And I can't wait to see you at your conference and then do more collaborations with you. So thank you for coming back to the show, Dave. Thanks, Ben.